Well, welcome. Tonight is a catch-up night. We heard of a program that didn't exist, that a couple of key people who are here tonight thought would be very, very helpful for the town and its residents, got funding for it, and now, what, that was what, two years ago? Yep, two years ago. Yeah. Two years ago, and now, two years later, we want to ask the question, how's it working? So let's start with introductions. Um, I'm Amy Leone um, with Community Impact and the Family Services Unit in Chris's Corner. Robbie Ticino, Chief of Police in Milford. Two years ago, you came on the show. You were talking about a new program that you thought Milford needed. Right. Didn't exist. You got some grant funding. Okay, two years later, what's going on? So, you know, when we, when we started this, you know, Amy and I had worked together, obviously, before we decided to take this on. And what precipitated this vision, if you will, was uh, taking it to the, basically, it came from the streets of Worcester. I, I, you know, I work as a paramedic there, and it was all about and is all about the follow-up care for people who struggle with other whether it be, you know, cancer, emphysema, or whatever it is, right? And that's the only way you can attack a disease process. Well, addiction, dependency is a disease. Mm -hmm. And what we used to say to each other, Amy and I, is we have to get off this merry-go-round. And it's one of my favorite sayings um, because that's where we were. We were on a merry-go-round with trying to help the people who struggle with this disease. So we came up with the concept of the Family Services Unit. And the Family Services Unit really is not only outreach, okay, but when somebody has a bad day, a bad week, and their disease is taking control for that time period, well, now the police and the clinicians can spearhead that, address it, give them the follow-up that they need, like you would treat any disease process, and prevent the crisis. You know, it's no different than, um, you know, I liken it to being on the ambulance and showing up at somebody's house and they're having a cardiac event. And they say to me, I said, you know, do you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure? They're like, well, not really. And I say, well, what does not really mean? Well, when I take my medicine, I feel okay. Okay. So what happened? Well, my prescriptions ran out about a month and a half ago. So you haven't taken your blood pressure medicine in almost two months? Yeah. Well, maybe three months. I'm like, okay. So this is the same thing, right? This is the same thing. So the success that we've had with this over the past two years after filing for the grant, putting this team together getting the right person because, you know, I will concede to the fact that not every police officer, not every clinician. Right. hundred percent. Is right for this position. Okay. We have a great team. We have an amazing team. So this team for the last two years has been out on the road, hand in hand, follow-ups, housing placement, addressing everything from homelessness to mental health crisis, to sometimes domestic violence. Family uh, support. Family support, getting people services they need. It, it's been, you know, it was supposed to do this much, Al, and it's done this much, okay? But now, when we've had no overdose deaths in 2024. Right, which is huge decrease for us. You know, it's... Huge, it's unheard of. And here's the thing, it's unheard of everywhere else in the state, all right? In fact, Amy and I are speaking at the International Chiefs of Police Conference in Boston this year. They came to Boston. We're presenting because guess what? Police departments all over the country want to know how we did this and what we're doing. Fundamental question. Yep. When Amy first came on... 20 she years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we and talked about disclaimer. people who were addicted to mm -hmm. opioids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up believing those are sleazy people in the back alleys of Boston shooting up heroin. And you enlightened us to say, no, it could be your neighbor's yep. son or daughter who got hooked on 
an opioid that was prescribed because of a sports injury. Mm -hmm. Question, do we need this community impact in Milford? Is there a demand for it? Absolutely. And, you know. And, and I, I apologize. I ask it, again, out of ignorance. No. 20 years ago when you described that my neighbor's son or daughter could be an addict and I wouldn't even know it. Well, and I think now you're seeing a lot of where people are, you know, like you had the heroin and people were injecting it and then now you everything has fentanyl in it. So now these pressed pills all have fentanyl in it, cocaine has fentanyl in it, so we're seeing overdoses related to that. So it could be anything. So now it's the point of educating the whole community on what to do if there's an overdose. You know, How do you deal with fentanyl? Thing. The efficacy is incredible. I mean, it's so much stronger. It's like a grain of rice. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking of the guys who are making up these pills, the less than pleasant people. Their analytical technique may not be uh, the best. Put a little bit, a couple grains of fentanyl in, and you could cause an OD. Mm -hmm. Death. You think, you think they care? Huh. Or but, I could get you addicted, huh. and then I could make more money. Yeah, and, and, you know, that, that story and, and, you know, song can play out. We could be here for days. Um, but this family services unit not only addresses the addiction component, but it, it goes down to helping us as a police department, as a society, mitigate domestic violence issues, okay, where there's some mental health concerns, all right, that aren't understood, by other members of the family. That's huge, is a misunderstanding, right? Understanding breaks down everything. When we can talk and we have an honest conversation, we can break down all these walls, all right? Well, when you sit with the parents and say, listen, your son or daughter, okay, is struggling because of X, Y, Z, right. and we're gonna help you, we're gonna help you help them navigate this. And that story goes on every day. The problem that we have is we can't publicize it, right? Because we have to make sure that we protect them. Um, these HIPAA concerns. The HIPAA, all, the HIPAA rules are going to keep you in. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of concerns, of privacy concerns. And so people don't get to read about it. You know what I mean? It's not splashed across the headlines. Um, but it's amazing to me when I have the doctors at the Milford ER saying to me, Right? Thank God you guys have this collaboration and have the family services unit. Are you kidding me? This is the hospital. Because without this unit, without Amy and her component, you know what happens when you leave the hospital? Here's a list of places. Give it a call. And here's a list of places. Give it a call. But what they don't tell you is all the places on this list no, don't fold. have an open bed. Right. Don't have it. She knows what beds are open. She has her fingers on the pulse of the mental health community, of the addiction community, of these people who are struggling with this disease. So we have this great system. <laughs> this, is, this is the shoe job that worked and is working. And because the state spent all kinds of money Guess what they did to our grant? What? All of it. All of it. 30 days notice. They canceled our grant. I thought it was a two, three year grant. It was well, a forever grant. It was a forever grant. Oh. And how much was that? 500000 500000 Gone. Now, thankfully, thankfully, we found the way to supplement a vast majority of it with the opioid settlement money that comes in, okay? So we have to restructure things, redo things, you know, um, change the way we're doing business, okay? But I got to tell you what, you'll be firing me as police chief before I let this program go sideways. Not going to happen. But wait a minute, the Sackler money is a one-time payment. No, it's in, it's like for the next 17 years. Yeah, it's funny. Oh, okay. It's, but it's I mean, one, it's... But it's but staggered, it's sta structured. Right. Okay, so we've got 17 years. Right. Because that's what would worry me is right. they put in X dollars of you know, opioid money. Right. And when that runs out, 
what do we do? Right. So this program, numbers don't lie, this program not only saves lives, it enriches the family dynamic that these people who struggle with the disease are in, which in turn enriches the community. I mean, I think this is some of the best work a police department can do is have a collaboration with mental health clinicians, addiction counselors, because without it, do me a favor. Get a refrigeration truck. We'll park it somewhere because people will be dying left and right. It's an epidemic. And the state doesn't see it or spent money on other things, and I'm not going to get into that. But we know what they spend money on, and a lot of it is not going to where it should go. Now, before your efforts, mm -hmm. how many people were dying in Milford on overdoses? Play, play right Just roughly. It doesn't have to, no, there doesn't have to be anything rough about it. I got numbers. Oh. Um, so before, we were having um, at least four to five overdose deaths a year before this, this unit was up and running. So every other month we were losing somebody in Milford. Right. Now that's death. That's not just overdose. Right. That's death. That's death. Okay? Then the numbers went like this for overdoses. 45, 38, 25, 21. And like that's unheard of in the state. Like unheard that's, of. That's like the whole thing. And even right. during, so the big thing was like during the, um, COVID, right? The opioid rates skyrocketed. The deaths skyrocketed. Here, we decreased. And it's all about the fact that we've been doing this for a long time. We have Chris's Corner. We have the Family Services Unit. We have Community Impact. We have all these resources here. And we've built the trust of all the people. And now people know that, like, if they relapsed or if a family member is having a struggle, they know where to go. And they don't feel that shame. We've reduced that stigma so people can come, whether it's mental health or substance abuse, and say, I need help. Or it's domestic violence. We have trauma support. You know, we have Wayside in Chris's Corner, too, that's able to help if you have domestic violence issues or homicide bereavement or whatever it may be. So we now have reduced that barrier to opening up and saying, I need help, or I know somebody who needs help, which is huge. Well, Chief, when you came on the program years ago, I asked you, why is Milford Police Department so different? Because all you read about in the paper is protests to cut funding, uh, protests against police procedures. And yet in Milford, I'm pretty proud of the fact that we have had two demonstrations regarding the police. One, we stood in the rain. But it was saying thank you, mm -hmm. yep. appreciating what our police force does. Of course. This just seems like another plank in the uh, building that you're yeah. adding. Yeah, and, and you know what are we supposed to be doing? What are we talking about? We're talking about saving lives. We're talking about getting people to a place where not only can they be proud of themselves, but they can be proud of their community. And you know, without that, well, and if we don't strive to that, then, then what are we doing? I, you know, then I'm confused, you know? Um, well, you talk about saving six lives, and that's not trivial. Right. You know, if it's every other month losing a Milford resident. But if it's 30 or 40 overdoses, you're saving that many families. Right. Because I don't know that I would know how to deal with. I want to believe I would go out and do the research and analytically put together a plan if one of my family became addicted. But I don't know that I could be that objective. But even in being in the situation where, you know, like I have a loved one that's, what, that's in recovery right now, and even knowing all of the things that I know, I wasn't able to help him and I didn't know what to do. So I had to be able to lean on the people that were there for me you know, that had the resources to help. Because when you're in that situation, no matter what you do for a living, it's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing to know because your heart is in it. So to know that we 
have helped and been a resource for all these families is like exactly why we do what we do. So without community impact, I think I watched the, the um, shows on TV where they show somebody leaving prison, mm -hmm. where they hand them their their bag of what they brought in yep. and say, <laughs> yeah, well, where do these people go? What do they do to start a well, new life? Well, exactly. Now, so you've had somebody, let's say, you know, to your point, come out of prison, right? Well, their disease came with them. Right. Their disease came with them. So who's going to help manage that? Okay. And, you know, as much as people want to, you know, bemoan about money, okay, let's just talk about the overdoses where somebody doesn't die. Okay. Let's talk about the ones where somebody doesn't die. Do you know what it costs when you overdose? We have to take you to the hospital. All the resources at the ER. If you end up in the ICU, okay, you're talking easy, easy, north of $50,000. Well, that goes on when we don't have this pro When we didn't have this program, that went on two or three times a week like it was, like, like delivering the mail. You could count on it. Right. It was all, it was constant. It was constant. You could count on it. Is well, it the way our police officers handle these incidents that keeps them calm and we never hear about them? Yes. Because if somebody was to ask me, is Milford safe? Yes. Yeah. Does Milford have gangs? Not that I know of. Yeah. Does Milford present an optimum environment to raise your family? Yes. And then you hear about all this stuff that goes on. Mm-hmm. So the only common factor in that has got to be the way the police officers and associates handle it. The, the difference, you know, between somebody fighting with the police, because we all know what happens there, okay, is we have a lot of people that we show up and they will say, nope, get a hold of Amy. Get a hold of somebody from Chris's Corner. Get a, you know what, I, you know, guys, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to, okay, all right. Is anybody from the family services working right now? All Is the time. It, th that's like... So these people know. 100%. Yes. Yes. Because they've built relationships. And, and you asked, what's the difference with the Milford Police Department? It's that, and Robbie and I have said this the whole time, is that, you know, like for many years, is that it's like a family. You know, and that's the difference, is that everybody has been working for years together. You know, like... The chief is the chief now, but when we started, he was patrol, yeah. you know? So it's like he started all the way up and we kind of saw this whole thing grow and knew exactly what needed to happen. And it's set apart from other departments because it is, a, it is a family. Has the way Milford Police recruited helped? Because I remember you were deputy back when you came out and said, we're trying to recruit people who speak Portuguese, yep. who speak Spanish, mm -hmm. who come from... The Milford area. Yeah. I mean, these people have a vested interest. If you're a Milford person, yeah. you care. I mean, I don't want to say people who don't come from Milford care less, but it just feels like you're going to care more when. Well, well, it's a sense of belonging, right? It's a it's a sense of belonging. Um, you know, in the family services unit, you have you know Sergeant Pinto, who speaks Portuguese and and Spanish. You know, Paul was actually born in Portugal, you know, and then you have Amanda Rizzoli, same thing, you know, speaks um, Portuguese and Spanish. They both speak it fluently. You know, we've hired a couple officers that, again, Portuguese, Spanish, and, you know, I hope to bring another, you know, one or two on in the very near future, Portuguese and Spanish, you know, um, we have a good complement, but it's important to have them in the family services unit because they do a lot of... I want to say warm handoff right. from the school resource officers and they can help the kids that are here, right? Kind of bridge that gap. And we've done all that. And the program is so successful. Not only are we not interested in cutting it back, we wanted to expand it. <laughs> and that to have the state, you know, for again, everybody bemoans about cost and police need to do more with mental health. Well, we did it. We have the numbers to show it. We have the, the whole community, the, that, you know, that full circle family to show it. 
And the state there said, any logic? Well, they, they can't give us what they don't have. Right. Well, is that it's just yeah. pure yeah. budget? Yeah, budget. pure budget. Can't give us what they don't have. Now, you know, me, because I like a good argument, well, why don't you have it? And isn't it important that we have it for this? You know, nobody at the Milford Police Department is, you know, having staked in as at work and they was flipping the dime, you know. I mean, the, every dime goes into outreach, you know, uh, making sure people have what they need. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I've gone into my own pocket to get somebody a hotel room, that way they could take a shower, get them off the street. I mean, you know, what's going on here? And for the state to, oh, we, we just don't have the funding. And I believe they don't have the funding. But why don't you have the funding? I mean, that's a conversation for another day. Well, that's always the issue, is what you're spending it on. Is that right. the realistically the top priority? Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, re when you think about it, I believe the town has been very supportive of our cops and their Absolutely. efforts. Absolutely. Of course. You know, I mean, I still remember, <clears throat> it was about the police, that town meeting, I've never seen town meeting go crickets. Right. Yeah, definitely not a town meeting. No. You know, you got 200 some people yeah. who are charged, dedicated. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always a, a level of conversation. And when we went through the budget and somebody brought up the f idea of defunding the police, yeah, it was like somebody turned the lights off. Yeah. Even Mike Nofri, who under the um, town meeting rules automatically seconds yeah. all the mo said, is there a second out there? Yeah. And it was kind of a rhetorical question like, yeah. Defund our police? Yeah. Now, we'll always argue that we, you'll need more police. We can't afford it. And, of but course. That's, you know, every year we start yeah. off with a budget where we yell, we're broke. Yeah. We have no money. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, each department wants a $9 billion increase. And then once we get through the graphics and the shenanigans, we say, okay, now, Chief, what can we really right. get through with? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you know, on the other side of the coin, I, you know, as much as I think the town is lucky to have the police department it has, the police department is also lucky that we have the citizenry we have. And there's no question, you know. Um, and it's been a great partnership. You know, our reputation is not that of this pugilistic, authoritative, you know, oh, hey, did you hear I got that guy? Like, No. You know, the, you know, the quote unquote, you know, water cooler talk is never, hey, we arrested so-and-so last night. It's a, you know, so-and-so had a bad night. Let's hopefully Amy and them can work with him and, and, you know, this and that. Yeah, I heard, huh, had a tough night. Ah, that's a shame, was doing so good for so long. Those are the conversations that go on around the Milford water cooler. And that's the type of police department that you want. But that's why we respect our police so much. Absolutely. You know, we, we can say we have great citizens, and I believe Milford does, but respect is earned. Absolutely. And if the officers weren't earning our respect, you wouldn't have the support. Of course. I mean, we've put a lot of money when we found out that you were talking through tin cans and strings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you start... And it's hard for the average person to understand that the police locker room cost half a million dollars. Yeah. Hmm. You know, and it's then you money. start explaining that officers have guns and you want a safe place for them to lock up their guns and ammunition yeah. and you don't want to force them to take it home. Right. So all the infrastructure, officers, I mean, they got their bat belt on. Right. They look like Batman <laughs> yeah, with all the... absolutely, yeah. And all those yeah. things need charged. Yeah. So you have electric. I mean, I can't imagine the size of the electric conduit <laughs> to yeah. the locker room. Well, yeah. But it went through once we explained that we needed sure. it. The radios. I mean, I got such a kick out of hearing that when you went down to Oliva's, <laughs> the area in Oliva's, you got the Franklin Fire Franklin Department Fire on the radio. Department. Loud and clear. Got them loud and clear. Oh, my gosh. No, no problem. Yeah. But now the program itself. Somebody has a problem, and I think we're finally to the point where we're not looking at it as something disgraceful and horrible and right. something you look down on. Somebody has a problem. They go, if they need a Narcan shot, 
they get an Arcan shot, starts their respiration again, they're alive, and they leave the hospital. Now, hopefully, they've got a supportive family that they can go to, but what happens if they don't? Well, and I think before they even leave the hospital, that's where the family services unit comes in, is that we're already at the hospital. Oh. Making sure that they know who we are, they have, you know, we've put a face, like, you know, we've let them know this is what we, who we are, this is what we do, this is what we can follow up with, make sure that we get, you know, their information and, you know, kind of make that relate start that relationship so they can either call us or we call them and we or we go right there the next day and we follow up and we also follow up with the family who was there with them when they overdosed so that we can make sure we give them that support too because seeing that isn't easy and knowing the struggles of addiction you know being supportive of the family members whoever that may be in the house or the friends or whoever you know so we make sure that we really do provide that wraparound services. And then if they want to go to detox or PHP or a sober house or they need counseling, they need a job, we have all those resources. Milford has so many resources here that we can, you know, that we've put in place over the years. So, you know, if it's, you know, Chris's Corner, you need case management, help with a resume, groups, AA meetings, you know, trauma support, recovery coaching, Therapy, it's it's all there. You know, do you need more intense therapy? We have that in Milford. Do you need sober houses? We have that in Milford. You know, so we have a lot of things that we can help that person who just overdosed. How many people do you serve a year? It's over th almost 3,000. And that's individuals. That's not including all of the families that come along with that. 3,000 people take advantage of this program. Al, and I'm going to tell you, her numbers are way low. Because we don't even track, you know, you don't think of it. But you have somebody who lives on the other side of town and needs a ride to CVS to pick up their meds. Okay? These are things we don't even track. That the group from the family service unit, because they're unmarked police cars, okay? They're police officers that dress in plain clothes, clinicians in plain clothes. It looks like a bunch of people pulling into CVS for a Gatorade, right? So they're not embarrassed. But what do they do? They give them a ride, get them home. How about some food? Give you a ride to pick up some food, pick up some diapers. That stuff goes on all the time and is not even tracked and recorded. So our police officers are shuttling people around to when help When they them. need it, absolutely. Take them to the food pantry so because if you have a family of five, you can't carry all that food that they yeah. give you at the food pantry. I mean, it's wonderful, but we'll be able to drive you back to your house, you know, so that you can get the food to feed your family. I mean, today is a perfect example. We have somebody that he had, you know, he's homeless, got his check cashed, and thank God we got him into a shelter, but now it's the matter of getting the check cashed, you know, getting him to the shelter, arranging the taxi, medication appointments, you know, all these things that come with helping an individual that, you know, the chief is right, we don't track those things because they're just helping that individual. But there's so many aspects of the things but that But stuff do. like that, okay, Robbie, you give me a check. I go home, I take my stamp, I stamp it, I put it in an envelope, give, send it to Milford Fed. It just happens. I don't think that happens for everybody. No. Well, not even close. No, you know, not even close. I mean, a lot of times, you know, we ran into this before we got the family services unit started up and running. We'd have somebody that needed to get to a shelter or needed to get to, right, to a clinic, mm -hmm. um, to a rehab, to a sober house. We do all this running around. We do this. We do that. We spend hours running around. Then we'd be like, how are we getting them there? Right. Oh, uh, I'd have to call the chief and be like, hey, chief, listen, uh, so I'm going to give you the bullet points. So-and-so overdosed today. Yeah, I heard. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Can I drive them out to wherever? Can somebody drive them out to here? Can we get an unmarked cruiser that somebody's not using to drive them somewhere? Or Amy's going to drive them, but she can't be going by himself. Well, that stuff happens on the reg. Right. And it's this family services unit, her team, these officers, 
that make sure people have placement, get to where they're going. I mean, I tell the story all the time about the, the you know, me going to get my allergy medicine at CVS. And an individual comes walking out all upset that I have a history with. She knows who this individual is, and we're not going to say any names. He comes out and, and is all upset. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? I was off duty. I'm like, what's going on? They won't give me my medicine. I'm like, all right, relax, relax, calm down. Stay here. Okay, Tazino, stay here. I go in, I talk to the people behind the counter. I'm like, what's going on with so-and-so? Well, who are you? I said, well, I'm the police. I said, I'm here trying to help. Well, what's going on? Well, you know, the, it's a different insurance carrier with the state, and something changed or whatever. I go, okay, but do you have his medicine here? Yeah. Okay, can you just pay for it? It's his medicine, right? Right. And how much is it? X, Y, Z. Okay, here's the money. And I took it out and said, here you go. Here's your medicine. All right? But the point is, if you can't do that, that person's going to spiral out of control. This person is not an addict. Addict. This person is not sleazy. This person is a longtime Milfordian. And they suffer from mental illness. But without their medicine, this person spirals, will start drinking, and then the fight is on. Literally, the fight is on. So now, out of the 3,000, this is a horrible question, but i got to ask it. How many are Milfordians? Um, probably about 95% of them. Okay. Yeah. Because that's always the question, yeah. sure. you know, that we face when we put programs yeah. in that we draw from other towns and the Milford taxpayer ends up helping. And we had this argument about special needs kids. And I remember saying, you know, if on the way to helping Milford special needs kids, we help a few from towns around us, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, we can't put in a program that's designed for non-Milford people. That's not fair to right. the taxpayers. Sure. And, and but, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, to sit here and say none of this goes to helping people from out of town or surrounding towns is not the truth. You know, it does. Um, but that benefits us all because it's all linked. Right. Okay? It's all linked. And, again, the biggest problem we have, unlike car accidents, right, I can say to you, I need to put on a traffic division, which I need to do well. I need to put on a traffic division because we have this many things going on. I have this many cars traveling through Milford. I have this, I have that. Well, I can't disclose all these Milfordians that are suffering. Right. Right. And that's always a huge roadblock for us because people can't see it. They can't well, the, see it. The better the job that the Milford police does, the harder it is to justify them. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And I say you that know, all the time. If you had muggings and murders on the street, yep. well, then everybody gets up in arms. Absolutely. When you turn around and say, do you feel safe walking down the Milford streets? Yes. Yep. Well, then we don't need as many police, do we? Right. Right. It's, right. it's a double-edged sword. I, I, I think I got a kick out of the people in Minneapolis where they cut back on the police presence, and then they were surprised that crime went up. Crazy. Funny how that works. You know, it was like... Yeah. What did you expect? The bad people are going to say, well, we can't commit as many crimes because there's not enough police sure. around? Makes tons of sense. Yeah. But those are the things we struggle. And that's, you know, I, I, I say that all the time, you know, and I say it to the fire department too. I said, we've done so much with less that it hasn't helped us. It hasn't helped us because, you know, we've people need to be a realist and understand that you need to address certain things, and the only way you can do that with, is with personnel. Um, you know, if I had, you know, I feel horrible for people that you know have lived in these communities, you know, their whole lives, and are requesting more of a police presence for speeding, parking, stuff like that. And I say, okay, we'll send somebody over, and then I'll stop by the house. I'll do a follow up with them, and I'm like, well, have they been out here? Yeah, you know, but I said, what's the matter? Well, he was only here for 10 minutes and he left. Well, because he had to go to a sexual assault. I, I can't have him doing radar on your right. street when Instead there's a sexual of. assault. Instead of. It doesn't work like that. Oh, is there a lot of that in Milford? I'm like, there's a lot of that everywhere. But see, again, Chief, that is 
the best compliment to the police force. Is there a lot of crime right. in Milford? I agree. To our detriment, though, Al. I agree. Yeah, but at the end of the day, when we went before the town meeting, we mm -hmm. was over a million dollars worth of equipment yep. upgrades in a couple of years. Sure. We didn't get a lot of pushback. Yep, I agree. I mean, we had people coming to us saying, you're spending an awful lot on police hardware. Yep. Yes, we are. Right. And it was like, well, why? I said, because they need it. Right. And, and you, know, you, you hit the nail on the head, and you said this before, too. You know, when Chris George, you know, comes to you and says, hey, on, Jan on June 6th, we're going dark. And I'm like, what does that mean? I was like, well, we're not going to be able to use the radios anymore. We'll be yelling out windows. Right. I was like, how does that happen? We can't have that happen. And But that goes to show the fiscal prudence and the hard work people like yourself have done working with the police department over these years. But it doesn't last forever. Yeah. And, and that's the sad reality of it. We didn't replace anything, and I always say this, there are no niceties, luxuries, that we don't need going on at the Milford Police Department. Zero. You know, you, you talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. Okay, let's say we don't spend the money on the lockers. Let's say we don't do it. Gun goes off. Uh. Right? Somebody gets hurt or even killed. Well, how'd that happen? Well, why, is, why wasn't your weapon secured? Where do you want me to secure it? The doors are falling off my locker. We have high school lockers. Right. Right. And I think that's, that was what turned my mind immediately, is when we said, are we forcing officers to take ammunition, guns, home? Yeah. Because they don't have a place to securely Correct. store it. And you sit there and say, that just doesn't make any sense. No. You're putting an officer's family... Because even though they're trained and they're all professional, they can make a mistake. Of course. And the mistake doesn't even have to be their own. Yeah. The mistake doesn't have to be their own. So the biggest part of your resources goes to what? Is it to provide housing? Is it to provide counseling? No, I mean, I think it's to provide, you know, that in the moment response and then the follow-up and then the services that are entailed with the follow-up. So it's almost like our main thing is the whole circle, making sure that we're there immediately when something happens, we're there to follow up, we're there to support the family and we're there to provide the resources. And then we're there to see them when they start to succeed or if they fall back, we're still there. But everywhere, and you mentioned it, that you got a list of places, and they're all full. How close to full are we? As far as our resources being stretched thin? Yes. Well, providing housing, providing... Well, we're, it, you know, we're, we're no different than the rest of the country, right? Right now, we're a stretched rubber band, okay? Um, but I can promise you this, without this collaboration... Without this team, without this unit, like I said, get me a refrigeration truck because that's what's going to happen. And there's no nice way to say it. But you hit it when you said six people a year die, which is a horrible number, but 40 or 30 overdose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you start thinking of the impact that that has, you know, on all the families. And, you know, I'm a bit Portuguese-centric coming from a family who came from Portugal. And the worst thing you could do was embarrass your family. Of course. So I could see a double whammy with a family-centric unit trying to deal with the fact that, you know, my father would have told me, just stop. Be a man. Stop. Right. Right. Because it was looked at as a choice, not, sure. you know, a, a, an indication. Right. And, and, you know, think of it this way. You, you know, you're an intelligent, articulate, educated person. Um, picture a family who's been just hardworking, um, doesn't have the education, the background, and they're trying to deal with somebody who struggles with this disease process. Um, how do you think that goes? Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, the outcome for everybody 
is bad, not only for the person who struggles, but for the family because there's usually an overreaction. Sure. Right? Or an underreaction. And now the whole family's... Well, I could see it because my father was as supportive as I could ever ask. But he didn't understand English originally. So when we had something at school, they would tell him that you should go to the school to support your son. He put on his hat, put on his coat, go down there, sit in the auditorium, and have no clue. But he knew he was supposed to be there. So I wonder if it had been something like an addiction, how would he even know what steps to take if you don't have programs like yours? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and for these people who don't understand the disease process, I always say this to them, you know, um, I don't drink. That's not by virtue. It's just because I don't like, like drinking. It, it's that simple. I don't smoke. Not by virtue. I don't like to smoke. It's that simple. So until you struggled with a disease process that consumes you, that is always on your back, that you have to not, first of all, to acknowledge it, right? I mean, she's the professional. That takes, that's a bunch of lemon peeling right there, right? And then to try to come to a place where you can mitigate it, well, that's a whole nother bushel of lemons. So how can anybody who doesn't struggle with these things, understand these things, know how to help their family member? You can't. It, well, I would call Amy. And that, and you think about, you could have somebody who their whole life has been straight and narrow. Right. And all of a sudden, they get hooked on an opioid for a knee problem. Right. You can say somebody is planned, articulate, all of it, but who knows what kind of effect. Right. Or we've known people who lost a spouse. You know, my life is my darling bride. Without her, I don't know. I'd like to believe that I could be logical and ca my life would fall apart. Yeah. How I would take it, I don't know. You yeah. know, you mentioned when I had my cardiac issues, they said, do you drink? Oh, no, first they said, do you smoke? And I said, yes. He said, how many packs a day? I said, no, I do a cigar about every three, four months. He said, well, that doesn't count. Right. Do you drink? I said, yes. Whenever I have a cigar, I have a drambouille or a scotch. Right. But that's not a disease. That's right. a choice. Right. You know, you look at people who've lost their spouse and they fall into a bottle. I can't understand what they're going through. Right. And what I count on is people like you to teach me how to be supportive. Right. And that's what they do. Right. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, addiction, and we talked about the opioid settlements, and I say to everybody, why do you think there was an opioid payout in the settlement? Because what they were doing was wrong. Yeah. They were taking our best, our brightest, and our most vulnerable, and they made a choice to come out with a product that was going to keep them addicted, keep them coming back, and that's what happened. I mean, the stories of successful athletes, mm -hmm. successful you know, um, doctors. I mean, you don't think in my 30-some years as a paramedic that I've known a doctor or two that has succumbed to addiction? I have. Right. And it's amazing because when you met the Sacklers, they mm -hmm. seemed normal. They seemed like normal business people. Mm. They had no idea the depth, the ugliness that was behind their yeah. motives. So, again, you just never know. What? You know, what they did to families, countless families, is just undefensible. Yeah. And, and it's still going on, and we're, and, and we're living with it, because... It, you know, now what you have is you have the hardcore criminal element right. that wants to piggyback on it and profit from it. You know, the thing that's always made me nuts as a police officer is arresting somebody who manufactures and deals and they've never taken the drug in their life. Yeah, well. Oh, I, I'm like, I, wow, that's just amazing. I was like, that's great.
So you don't touch your own poison. Yep. Yep. What is the biggest thing the town of Milford can do to support these efforts? Well, when we, we've always had a lot of support from the town, right? Um, we're going to be going to town meeting to get an extension on, like I said, we've been able to move a bunch of stuff around to get partial funding, but we need the town to fund a portion of this moving forward. So that it doesn't disappear. So it doesn't disappear. What kind of numbers are you talking about? 175000 For a year? To get me through until July 1st. And then you build it into your budget? Is yep. that the idea? Mm -hmm. Yep. When you think about that number, is so tiny for the number of people that are going to be... No, counted. people are going to think about $250,000 a year is a big investment because they don't understand. Well, that's why I get up at town meeting and I help people understand. You know, because two hundred fifty grand is a lot of money. It's one hundred seventy-five for. Right. So, but but the argument to that is, you know, um, lose little, lose big. Well, no, Robbie. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> Town meeting has never gone against the needs of our kids. Right. You know, of all the decades have been involved in town mm -hmm. meeting, when it comes down to a new football field, is that a need? Eh, you can argue. Yep. A new baseball field, a new town park. Mm -hmm. This falls above those in my mind. I would hope so. Yeah. You know, because you're really saving people and families. I and again, so. I know I sound cold, but it's not the six that died. It's the 40 times four members of families, the hundreds of course. that get affected. And it's the thousands that we help every year, you know. And it's, you know, and it's, and it's also that Milfordian who lives by themselves who suffers from dementia, right. Alzheimer's, that they go to and help and get Meals on Wheels services or help them with fuel and all these other things. Like, all that's being done by this team. Making phone calls just to get your electricity turned on because it got shut off. Right. And, you know, somebody who can't see and, th and they're making phone calls and helping them. Like, these are the little things that happen. Every day. Every day. It's like nonstop. You know, the, the unit is never in the building. You know, like, we, we're outside and they're everywhere doing so many different things. But I things. think that's something that we have to spend more time is educating people like me who don't like know. Well, what do you mean? You just call the electric company. Yeah. It's not that easy for some people. Yeah. I don't speak the language. Yeah. Huge. Or right. I've got mental disease and I have a problem. Or I so can't just, get to the grocery store. Or I can't get to the store. Well, it's like you mentioned. I can go to the pantry and get free food. Great. How do I get it home? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, these are things that people don't take into consideration, okay? Well, why can't their family help them? They're 80-something years old. They don't have their family anymore. They're all alone. And we talk about the Milford thing, right? Milfordian, Milfordian. I'm talking about super pe certain people, and I'm not going to mention last names, that have a last name like mine whose, you know, grandparents' name is on the World War I monument you know, next to my grandparents' name, that have nobody anymore. Yeah. Right. That we show up because the neighbor hasn't seen them in two days. They're on the floor. We call Family Services Unit to come down, get them services, get someone to help come in and clean their house, make sure they're clean. I mean, you talk about the Milfordian, well, there it is. Right. I well, mean, thank you for everything you're doing. Well, thanks for having us on. And I think it's important that we keep this message going. Yeah. Because it's the things we don't understand. Right. Things we, you want to believe that people take care of their family, but some families don't. Because they don't even know how to begin. So, yep. as always, to our six loyal viewers, hopefully we gave you a little bit of insight as to some of the services. The most important thing is if you think you need help, reach out to Community Impact. How's the best way to get a hold of you? I think right through the Milford Police Department is probably So the call best. the police department and explain to them what you need, and they'll put you in contact and get you help. 
Thank you again. Thank you. As Thank always, you. may God bless. May tomorrow be a better day than today. Thank you.